everyone, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time in this venue today. It's lovely, lovely to see all your faces. So I am Maria and uh, Ron gave a, a mouthful of an introduction and I'll uh, go ahead and give a little introduction on myself as well. So um, when uh, we are talking, so when we're, what we're talking about today is the nervous system and I am going to be coming at this topic through my clinical experience. So I'm saying this because I am not a psychologist. Um, I'm not a trauma expert, but we are working with the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve is connected to those, uh, those situations. So um, as I was working in the field of nutrition, um, oh, and I, my disclaimer is then is, is that if you want to use these, these therapies for trauma, I recommend that you work with a trauma therapist at the same time. Um, I use it, uh, when people in my clinic, uh, tend to, to, it, when it brings out trauma, we really have to make sure that we're well supported when we're doing that work. So my disclaimer ahead of time is that this may, this may seem like kind of a, um, it's not simplistic in any way. This is, this is pretty deep. It's a pretty deep dive in the body and it's got all kinds of connections to it. Okay. So today I'm going to be coming at this topic through the, my, my work with uh, gut healing and, um, and, and gut problems that we have like SIBO, ulcerative colitis, um, just uh, food allergies and sensitivities. But as you'll see, as we go, there's a lot of information around this. Um, okay, so that's a disclaimer. Uh, so one, uh, so I've been working with people for many years on healing their gut issues. Uh, you know, they come to the clinic and they're having a really hard time digesting food. They're having a hard time relating, having a relationship to food. And so I have been doing all kinds of different types of diets and um, different therapies. And then one morning, it just, I had this very strong intuition. I woke up one day and I said, this is not the gut. This is not the gut. I've been chasing people's gut dysfunction for so long. And it occurred to me, this was a much deeper issue. This was the autonomic nervous system. So with that little drop in of, of intuition, I started really pursuing that line of research and study. And sure enough, I was spot on with this. And um, so I started uh, putting together a program in our clinic where I was working with people and it's not just gut health. It's uh, we work, you know, we now put every single patient that comes to our clinic through uh, an autonomic nervous system regulation practice, because we do know it's the opening of the physical body. If we can get the autonomic nervous system regulated, it optimizes all treatments. If we're working with a cancer patient, their treatments start to, to work much better. Um, uh, nutrition is better. Sleep is better. Um, pain, body pain is improved, um, all kinds of really beautiful benefits from regulating the nervous system. Okay. So with that being said, at this point, does anyone have any questions about that before we jump into the slides? Great. Okay. Ron, let's go ahead and launch the slides. Ron. Maria, that's what? showing up over here as already displayed. Hang on. I'm coming back. Mercury's in retrograde, I guess, right? <laughs> Thank you. You're being good. Isn't it me. always? <laughs> Damn. When in doubt, it's close to retrograde if it isn't, right? Yeah. You see that now? All right. Okay, I'm getting big again. I'll go back out and make this just wonderful for you. 
<laughs> there you are. See what we got. You looking at it now and it's just fine? Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank so you. let's just start with this slide. We are going to be talking about the autonomic nervous system today. The autonomic nervous system is a part of the central nervous system. And you've got, you know, a few other uh, branches of the central nervous system. You've got the autonomic nervous system, which is uh, it's, it's going to have the, all the cranial nerves. It's got the sympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve and the enteric nervous system. Um, the, uh, the central nervous system is like the chief regulator. And then the autonomic nervous system is really about all the processes in your body that you don't think about. You're not thinking about telling your heart to beat. You're not thinking about telling your stomach to digest or to produce uh, gastric juices. You don't tell your uh, spleen to function. It just, it, all that is being informed through the autonomic nervous system. Now, the beautiful thing, there is one, uh, one opportunity in the autonomic nervous system that we can take advantage of that we actually can consciously uh, work with, and that is our breath. And that is so powerful to know because that is a tool that we always have for our, our regulation. So I do a lot of breath work with, with patients. Um, it's one of the first things we start with is breath work because the breath, not only does it allow a regulation of the vagus nerve, but it changes the chemistry, the biochemistry of the body. Um, and when that, when we, we can have that powerful of, of an effect, uh, that in turn is going to benefit regulation of the other systems. So our breath is very important. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but the, um, okay. So the vagus nerve vagus is a Latin term for wandering. It's a very long, long nerve. It starts in the medulla and it, it comes down, splits off. It comes out of the medulla on both sides and it comes down and comes around through the carotid sheath and it, it, it comes around loops into the, you've got various cranial nerves that are also looped into the vagus nerve. They're all communicating with one another. Vagus nerve is loops, in, loops into the pharyngeal and it comes through the aortic arch and then it goes all the way down to the colon. And so the vagus nerve is actually informing all of your viscera on how to function. The other 10 cranial nerves are all about survival. Our cranial nerves are about how we are actually receiving and interpreting the information in the world around us, the environment. So we've got auditory nerves to hear the most powerful, actually the, the very first cranial nerve was our ability to smell. So we have smell, taste, hearing, sight, and then we have facial expression. We have nerves that come down and allow us to raise our, our eyebrows so that we can be interested. We open up our eyes wider. Um, we can smile or we can uh, close our face down and warn people not to get too close. Or when people are very shut down, we call it an unaffected uh, uh, facial cues where you might see uh, they don't have any expression. People, when they get very shut down, there's very, very little affect to their face. And that has to do with the cranial nerves that run through our um, muscles for uh, expression. And so these are really important because the, the cranial nerves are, are, they keep us alive, right? So taste and smell, we were able to keep ourselves from eating poisonous things from, you know, uh, we would smell things that would either attract us or repel us. Um, listening, uh, we can hear the sounds of predators. We can hear, you know, the sounds of, uh, of a mother cooing to a baby. You know, those are, so there's different, there all these things were designed uh, for us to be able to interpret information and keep ourselves alive. So the cranial nerves are still doing that job. They're, they're very, very important. 
Um, so all the cranial nerves are all about bringing that information in the vagus nerve regulates the interpretation of that information. And then it processes the information down through the body. So it's all connected. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So we have, you probably are all familiar with the term sympathetic and parasympathetic. So, um, the parasympathetic system is what the vagus nerve is actually regulating. The sympathetic chain is a part of the central nervous system, and it involves the peripheral nervous system, um, as well as, you know, it totally interacting all the time with the parasympathetic nervous system. And in a regulated state, what we can do is we can move back and forth between these two systems pretty fluidly. When we're dysregulated, we have a very hard time getting out of the, the sympathetic state and into the, the parasympathetic state. Now, sometimes people go overboard in the parasympathetic, and that's another form of dysregulation. So, and, and that is actually freeze. And so in this, on the sympathetic side where it says fight, flight, or freeze, we actually know now that the freeze is a really, really, oh, it's a big overexpression of the parasympathetic. So fight or flight, that is like, you know, you could go fight, flight, or flee, right? That is much more sympathetic where we are engaged in the process of staying alive. <laughs> it's like danger, gotta, gotta do something. We've got to mobilize, right? That is using our amygdala, the part of the brain that is reactive, get out of the way. There's a bus barreling down on you. You're not going to stop and wonder how fast is that bus actually going? How much time is it gonna take before it hits me? You know, you're not using your analysis. You are, the sympathetic chain is saying, move it. And so your lungs expand to get some air, your muscles get really strong. You're not even thinking, a lot of people say, God, I don't even remember what happened. I just had to get out of there. So the, the sympathetic nervous system is a very good system. And commonly people will say to me, oh yeah, the sympathetic, that's the bad one, right? And it's, it's not at all. If you didn't have that, you would probably not be here today. <laughs> so um, as it says, sympathetic is all about crisis management. It is about moving. It's about getting you out of danger. Okay. Parasympathetic is called the rest and digest. This is the, the system that most of us are, we want to be in for the majority of the time. Parasympathetic is where healing takes place. It's where our autonomic nervous system is in a very regulated state where it's taking care of all the things you don't have to think about. Uh, salivating, swallowing, uh, the, the, they, you know, we call it, um, lacrimation, but that's just tearing your eyes, getting enough tears, um, blinking, um, you know, when your immune system is functioning well, you're not thinking about these things. They're actually, it's all just a symphony happening in your body regulated by this, um, parasympathetic vagus nerve activation or regulation, right? So when we're in this regulation, we're actually able to get into a state of flow. When we're not in the parasympathetic state, the creative brain and the state of flow is off limits because we are really in a state of survival. Okay. All right. Next slide. All right. So the vagus nerve actually has two divisions to it. There's a front and a back. Um, the ventral vagal is associated with all of those cranial nerves I was talking about, cranial nerve five, seven, nine, 11. Um, a lot of people, when they've got uh, vagus nerve dysregulation, they feel it in their neck and shoulders. It's really, really common. The trigeminal nerve is tight. They're clenching their teeth at night. Their neck is really sore. People tell me they can't turn their head. Um, that is that those are a lot of symptoms around vagus nerve dysregulation. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me they go to the chiropractor over and over, they get adjusted, 
they feel a little bit better for a couple of days, but then they're right back into their, their uh, pain complex. That is a real indicator of a dysregulation. So that the ventral branch is, uh, if you looked at the vagus nerve, there's a front and a, front and a back, the ventral is myelinated. The dorsal branch is an unmyelinated nerve. It doesn't really matter. I'm using big terms to try to impress you, but you don't need to know that. Um, the dorsal branch is the branch that shuts us down. The dorsal branch will just like, so it is sort of the, it is the, I've got to shut you down to totally save your life. And that's what happens. So have you ever watched a nature show and you see a lioness grab an impala and they just go limp in the lioness's mouth? That is a perfect example of a dorsal vagal reaction. It is an absolute, it's a fainting, it's a, it's a freeze. It's a total freeze in the dorsal vagal uh, state. People become, they don't leave their homes. I'll just talk about some of the, the way it shows up. Um, they get a little bit disengaged socially. They isolate, they uh, uh, become fearful of other people. Um, uh, you can start hearing and seeing things that are actually aren't happening. It's a, almost like a form of hallucination, but it's also like auditory um, hallucinations where you're hearing and people go, God, I swear I heard that person say that thing. And, and they didn't. And that's a really, and then when they find out that those things didn't happen, it can make them feel really crazy. Like, oh my God, what's going on? Am I losing my mind? Am I schizophrenic? It's not, it is a severe parasympathetic overreaction. And so when we work with this, we can get people back into a regulated state. They go, oh my God, I, I feel, I'm starting to feel like myself again. So, um, so dorsal vagal can be a protection but dysregulation is when we stay in a certain state. Regulation is when we move through these states fluidly. Dorsal is protective. Let's just say somebody was attacking you and uh, fighting back was, is actually not an option for you. The dorsal vagal will protect you from having a heart attack. It will shut you down to the point that you, you're not going to have that strong of a sympathetic reaction. So it can be a very good thing as well. It's just, if it's, oh, if it's dysregulated, it becomes a bad, uh, not a good thing. It's not a benefit. Okay, go ahead, Ron, next slide. So in my line of work, what I have seen so much is how the vagus nerve is very, very much tied into the enteric nervous system. I'm gonna be honest with you about the enteric nervous system. It is the least well understood of all the nerve of all the parts and pieces of the nervous system. It's complex. It has neurons. Um, it has so many uh, pieces to it that they're so interwoven throughout the organs and through throughout uh, the the other nervous systems that the scientists are like we they haven't even fully mapped it. It's still sort of like the new frontier. So you've probably heard a lot about neuroplasticity in the last few years about how we can actually change our brain state by, you know, through neuroplasticity. Well, we're finding we can do the same thing with the gut because the gut has its own neuronal networks and the gut gets stuck in a rut in the same way the brain can. So we can get caught in these very, very, you know, like the, the saying, when neurons uh, fire together, they wire together. And I think Joe Dispenza says it something, he calls it when they sync up, they link up. So there's different little, you know, ways of looking at it. But when neurons fire together, they, they, they wire, they actually form these little wired networks. And then your gut begins, or your brain, or even your heart, your heart has neurons too. They start moving in the exact same direction all the time. You start getting caught in a rut. And so many times when I'm working with the patients at the clinic that have gut issues, these gut issues like are forming 
uh, like patterns, like people get caught in a pattern of reactivity. And so um, what I have discovered is that by helping people regulate the vagus, the, their vagus nerve, we actually release the enteric nervous system. It's like a, it's like a portal into the enteric nervous system. And not only can we start changing the behavior of their gut, all these other benefits start taking place that we're just blown away. You know, people just, you know, uh, getting out of fear, uh, re-engaging in their lives, um, starting to do art again, tapping into uh, systems that they have sort of moved away from. And the big one that I see is intuition, because when we can free up these systems, people start moving back into their creative brain. They're using their right brain again, because truly when we're in a state of survival, we are leaping from our fear brain into our solution brain, which is, I got to figure this out. I have to figure this out. I know that I can find my way out of this. If I can just think well enough, if I can think my way through, I'm going to analyze all the data. You can't believe the data people bring me. They're like, look, look, Maria, I've done all my research. I know everything about this. Right. And I have to like encourage them. What, how do you feel about this? Have you felt like, what do you really think is going on with you? And I get completely different answers when I get people to start thinking with their creative brain rather than with all the research they've gathered, you know, and research is great. I love it. I'm a research fanatic, but we have to take the research and use our creative brain to start making the connections of the research because research alone is not going to be the, the, the answer It's making a connection to, to yourself. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the enteric nervous system is really important because it is relaying information all the time. If the vagus nerve is relaying misinformation, and doesn't this sound like the world we're living in right now, we get misinformation and disinformation and it's happening right inside our own bodies. So what we really want to do is sort of clear out the, the, um, the confusion. Okay. All right. Next slide from Okay, so the wrecking ball, chronic stress, stress is the key. And, um, but I will tell you, there is, there's a way of looking at stress. So um, stress is sort of a dirty word, you know, it's like, oh, I'm so stressed out. Everything is stressful. The world is stressful. My, the news is stressful. I'm, I'm, I have to do this thing and I'm stressed. So the way we look at stress and we try to work with our patients in the clinic to look at it, there's stress. There's no way we're going to get away from stress. You know, sometimes just waking up in the morning is a stressful event for a lot of people. You know, as soon as they become conscious, they feel the pain in their body. You know, they're like they immediately start thinking about their day. So we have stress, which is we live with it. It's here. Um, it's the response to stress. How are we able to respond to stress in a way, you know, for instance, you know, Ron asked me to do this talk and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. That's kind of stressful. <laughs> the beauty of that stress is that it, it, it said, oh, Maria, maybe you need to actually get all of this stuff into a formatted form that you can share with people. So the, there's this huge benefit that's a motivating stress. Ron motivated me in a stressful way to bring this information to you today. That's fabulous, right? And that's stress that actually makes us feel good. And then, you know, like the stress of working out, the stre we stress a muscle in order for it to grow. So when stress is not good, is, is literally stress that is, part of this feedback loop, right? We're stressed out, vagus nerve gets dysregulated. It starts giving misinformation to the, uh, the body systems. The body systems give the information back, it stresses us out. Oh, I've got pain. I've got uh, food allergies. I've got, you know, headaches. I've got uh, neuropathy, you know, all these things start becoming part of that feedback loop. And so now our stress response 
is, is so great. It's, it takes us out of regulation. We have physiological shutdown. So when we start seeing this, we see people with, uh, can't regulate their blood pressure. Uh, they're constipated or they've got diarrhea. Um, they they can't remember where they put their keys. I can't remember what I told uh, you last time about, I mean, I have to take really good notes on people because I'll say, how are the, how is the headache complex for you? What headaches? I don't have any headaches. So it's very interesting, but when we are in a state of stress, um, the dorsal vagal will kick in to protect us from this chronic misinformation. And so we go into the shutdown. Um, the biggest thing is we go into uh, social engagement shutdown. When we are socially disengaged, we literally dysregulate the vagus nerve further because our social engagement is how we regulate the, the vagus nerve. And you probably know that, you know, you know, there are people in your life that you just love to be around the tone of their voice, uh, the things they choose to talk about going to, well, I won't say a family dinner, let's say going to, um, a dinner with your closest friends and you just look forward to it because you feel safe, you feel understood, you know, the conversation is going to be interesting that that allows, that actually is one of the greatest things for our health. One of the best things you can do is to engage. Okay. So next slide, Ron. So what, when we notice that th these symptoms start to occur in, in our bodies and our lives are, you know, the way our, if we feel sad all the time, if, you know, it's okay to be sad once in a while, but it's when we are chronically, when we get stuck in these states, um, we really need to look to regain the balance. Um, one of the first things that we tell people is, or we ask them is what's your exercise level? You know, are you getting out? Are you going on walks? Are you out in nature? Are you, are you getting away from the computer and the screens and the telephone and, are you getting away from the television and the news? Are you able to walk outside and just look around and see what's around you? Oddly enough, our optic nerve, this is how important our cranial nerve for the eyes is. There are four, there are two sets of cranial nerves just for the, the eyes. Because when we are looking around our world, when our eyes move back and forth, and we're looking around, we're actually engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. It's one of the very best things you can do is to be in nature looking around. Reading a book is the engagement of the parasympathetic nervous system. I have so many people tell me, I can't read anymore because as soon as I pick a book up, I fall asleep. Well, that is, <laughs> that is your parasympathetic nervous system at work. Oddly enough, or interestingly enough, when you're holding this little device and you're scrolling up and down, up and down, your eyes going up and down is activating the sympathetic nervous system. Like when we're in danger, our eyes are looking up, we're looking all over, right? We're everywhere. When we're at rest, we're not looking up and down. We're looking back and forth. We're always, you know, if you're sitting at a dinner table, you're looking back and forth at people. That is really important that our, the way we use our eyes is part of, a, a, it's an opportunity to regulate. So I think that's a, a really good thing to know. So physical activity, being out in nature, social engagement, um, using things like meditation so we can bring breath work in, movement, the body loves to move, any kind of movement, um, and then engaged in, in projects that that are uh, activating our right brain, our creative brain, so we can stop leapfrogging over from the fear brain into the analytical brain, and we can rest for a while in our beautiful right brain creative space, right? Where our intuition gets to flourish a little bit. Okay, I was gonna give you a quick example this morning, um, this morning I was uh, sitting on my couch reading and somebody walked outside and my dog leaped up 
and started barking wildly at the window. And of course, my sympathetic nervous system just went, oh, high alert, you know, what is going on? And then I realized what was going on. So I fluidly moved back into parasympathetic. My dog got down from barking and gave this tremendous shake all through her body, right? Started at her head and it just goes all the way down to the tail. And you've probably seen animals do this. So animals and we're animal, we're an animal. They know that when their sympathetic nervous system has been activated, they need to shake it off, right? We don't shake it off. What we do is we, uh, we curl up and we get really, uh, I don't want to do anything. I'm going to just shut down here. That's why exercise is so important. We are literally shaking off our nervous system when we get up and move around, jump around a little bit, just shake. I have people do it all the time when they're doing regulation work. Just don't forget every so often, get up and shake it around. Little kids know this. Have you ever, how many times have, have you seen little kids being admonished to stop wiggling, stop moving, you know, stop, stop making a fuss. Well, their nervous systems are clearing things. And so I never tell kids to stop wiggling. I'm like, wiggle it up, wiggle it out, get it out of you. You're trying to get something out. It's all good. And I think maybe we should adopt some of these behaviors that animals and kids teach us all the time. And that is wiggle, get your wiggle on. <laughs> okay, Ron, next slide. You bet. Okay, so some of the therapies I use in this, um, the main one that I, well, I use a lot. So safe and sound protocol, had, I, and I don't know if you're aware of this, you, you're free to look it up. We'll, at the Q&A at the end of this, we can talk more about it if people have questions. But I am certified in, um, as a therapist for safe and sound protocol. It was developed by a PhD named Stephen Porges. He has put, he's probably, God, I mean, he's got over 40 years of research in what is called the polyvagal theory. Now, the polyvagal theory is everything we just talked about, fight, flight, or freeze. Um, so the safe and sound protocol is using your physiology to re-engage you in a way to regulate your vagus nerve. And the way we're doing that is that we're using sound therapy, your middle ear. It's very interesting. When you are in a fight, flight, or freeze, your middle ear loses its bandwidth of frequencies. So it is now tuned in because you're in a threat mode. Your middle ear is tuned into very high pitched frequencies, which are like sirens, screams, right? Um, or very low pitched, which is the sound of a predator, a growl, a threatening voice sometimes goes into a very low, you know, someone who's threatening you. And we lose the mid range, which is the range where we feel soothed. It's this range that I'm talking to you right now. It's a very soothing, it's very prosodic. It is, uh, if a mother were talking to a child, they don't scream. Well, sometimes they don't, most of the time they shouldn't, but there's, we're not screaming to get somebody to stop. We're trying to talk to them in a, in reasonable tones. Um, that is very soothing to the nervous system. If you scream at a child, most of the time they're going to run away or they're going to hide from you and they're going to get in the habit of that. Right. So, um, our nervous systems are no different as adults as they were as babies. So we respond really well to humming, cooing, soft with the cranial nerves in the face. If you want to right now, just take your fingers and just run them down your cheeks. Just run them right down your cheeks. Do you feel that? Do you feel just so soothed by that movement? It's such a simple movement. All these nerves in our face, we do that to babies, don't we? We just rub their little faces and we just hum and coo at them and they go, mm, and they go to sleep. That we are no different. We are just big babies and we respond really well to that kind of touch. 
And these nerves are going through the face. They're all through the ear. You can pull on your ears. It feels so good. One of the ways to regulate the vagus nerve is just pulling your ears and moving them around and getting the skin moving, you know? So the safe and sound protocol, before I have people engage in it, I actually had them engage in a little, little self-massage, some breath work, a few uh, uh, exercises to release the tension in the trigeminal through the sternomastoid. Um, this gets very, very tense when we're dysregulated. And when I have people engage in these activities, their vagus nerve starts to regulate pretty quickly. So it's, it's really lovely to see. And then what we do with the sound protocol is you're listening to scientifically filtered music that is going to allow this, this bandwidth to expand back into a normal range so that the middle ear is no longer shut down and only receiving uh, you know, sounds of danger or sounds of threat right? We're bringing back in the sounds of safety. Okay. So that's what we do uh, with safe and sound protocol. And I'm happy to answer questions on that one. The bio well is a device I use. Um, at Ron, uh, the reason I'm even here today is because Ron loves the bio well so much. He comes in and has it done all the time. Um, he, and it has, I mean, Ron, you can speak to that. What do you think of the bio well as a therapy? Uh, in 2021, I ran what I called the Grandpa's Triathlon. That's 200 miles between Seattle and Portland. It's a Portland marathon. And it's a Spartan race of 21 different obstacles in just six miles. It's all really tough stuff. I couldn't have done it without bio well teaching me how to get out of my head and back into my um, protocol and my socialization with other like-minded adults. It was incredibly helpful. And the reason why I did all that fancy stuff, I turned 75. So check wow. out the extreme do it to it deal. Yeah. So thank you, Maria, for helping me live and get through this craziness. <laughs> of course. Absolutely, Ron. So, so I use the BioWell. BioWell is a, a way of assessing your pretty much your, the um, the electromagnetic field. You are electrical beings. You're an energy being, and so what we do is we assess how the energies are moving through your body in a regulated way. We look at at your photonic energy, and that gives me tons of information. I can very commonly I can just look at someone and say. Yeah, it just seems like you're, do you have any pain in the thoracic spine? And they're like, oh God, I have this rib out that I can't get back in and the chiropractor can't get it back in. And that's, that's nervous system dysregulation. When our spine, which is this beautiful little freeway for these, you know, central nervous system nerves, when it is out of place, it's either that something happened that knocked it out of place. You need to get it back in. But if you are always getting adjustments and you're not staying in an adjusted state, that's not your spine anymore. It could be, I mean, there are things like we sit wrong, people sitting at computers, you got your, you know, your chin jutted forward and that's a real dysregulator for the cervical spine. Um, scoliosis is super common, uh, dysfunction. You can work with people. Uh, rotated pelvis is going to be throwing the spine off. So we can actually see how the energy is moving in your body. And we can pinpoint areas in the spine that you really need to work on to bring back a regulated flow. It, think of it as anything. If you've got a kink, you got a kink in the garden hose, the water is not going to come out very fast, right? It's the exact same way with your spine. If there's anything that is kinking the spine, it's going to stop that regulation of the information flow. Okay. So we look at that a lot. Um, I am a huge uh, believer in acupuncture. It works very well with all these other therapies. Uh, I'm running out of time. So I'll go through this a little faster. Uh, you know, uh, emotional freedom technique tapping has been shown to really help in regulating the nervous system by 
by tapping into the various um, locations on the body where the nervous system has information flow. We can work with the vagus nerve by doing things like uh, hot and cold on the body. You, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, like if you're very dysregulated, a lot of people will get like a, a almost like a fibrillating feel. They'll get heart heart variability. They get a fast heart rate. Now, moving all pathology aside, I never tell anyone you if if you're having any kind of heart irregularities, you got to get it checked by a specialist to make sure that there is nothing wrong. There's nothing going on. Most of the time, the majority of the time, they are benign or, you know, irregular heartbeats that are really being caused by the dysregulated vagus nerve. The vagus nerve literally loops through the aortic arch. And so if it's dysregulated, we're seeing people with irregular heartbeats Sometimes throwing cold water on your face will, will put the heart back into rhythm because that is a direct connection to the vagus nerve. Okay. So, um, uh, things like Epsom salt baths are going to bring regulation in and that is, is now, uh, we go into the physiology. So Ron, let's go to the next slide. What I have found. Okay. We'll talk about, um, let's skip this slide. Go to the next one. Uh, bio, well, we talked about, so go to the next one breath work. I kind of talked to you about this breath work is so powerful because we're literally, literally balancing CO2 to oxygen. And that is so important to the vagus nerve, to your nervous system. We are terrible breathers and the more dysregulated we become, the worse we breathe. We're shallow breathers. We hold our breath a lot. Uh -huh. we suck in a lot of air and maybe not let the same amount out. You know, it's like, you know, gra gasping, we get air hungry. Um, we breathe through our chest. We're like, <sighs> you know, we're not diaphragmatic breathing where we're actually belly breathing. And what you want to practice is breathing. I, I teach the uh, patients at the clinic keep it simple, keep it simple. You know, there's all kinds of different breathing techniques and they're all used for different things. And there's brilliant people out there teaching breathing. But if you just want to calm your vagus nerve, take five minutes. I call it resonant breathing. Take five minutes, breathe through your nose, five breaths in, five breaths out or five counts in. Okay. Five counts in five counts out and you're breathing in your belly. So the main thing is you want to make sure that when you are breathing, your, your hands, not your chest, your belly's moving. So it's like, you should see your hands moving on your belly when you breathe. Noses are for breathing, mouths are for eating. So you always breathe through your nose. It's a very, very important part to resonant breathing. Mm -hmm. When we are in a chronic state of not using our breath, and this is our most powerful way to regulate our vagus nerve. It's the one, the one autonomic piece that we do have conscious control over. So when we are chronically over breathing, under breathing, and we're going to mess up our blood chemistry. And that's when we start seeing things go start to, to go wrong with like pain complexes and the sympathetic chain gets activated. Okay. So Breath work is really, really important. Okay, Ron, next. Um, what I'm really interested in in nutrition is what affects the vagus nerve um, through diet. And what we're finding is that there are macronutrients are very, very important. Your macronutrients are uh, fats, proteins, carbs. And those are the balance of the three macronutrients are pretty individualized. It has to do with so many factors, right? We're looking at, um, we're looking at uh, lifestyle. Are you active? Are you sedentary? We're looking at age. We're looking at um, male, female. We are uh, looking at um, uh, what it, how much muscle tone do you have? What's your BMI? All of that factors in to macronutrient balance. When the macronutrients are out of balance, 
if you're taking in too many simple carbs and you're not burning those off or you're too ketogenic and you've got too much protein coming in and not enough carbohydrate, all of these things are going to have an effect on the nervous system. And I work with people all the time on that because I kind of think, oh, I eat healthy, but eating healthy isn't necessarily the right way of eating for you. So eating diet is a very strategic, it's, it's a really strategic part of the health program. And there's so much information about, yeah, just eat like this, or just eat mostly plants. Or, I mean, that it's, it's not true because we are so different metabolically. There's so many different factors that play in. Um, some people have to have animal protein in their diet. They just have to. And some people don't do well with plants, you know, uh, some people alkalinize when they have animal protein and other people get too acidic and they can't have much animal protein. It's very, very individualized. So I don't think it's easy to just say, this is the diet you should follow. We always have to work and get the right one for the individual. Micronutrients are so important. B vitamins. We are discovering the connection between thiamine, which is B1 and the vagus nerve. It is a powerful connection. And when people are deficient in thiamine, they're very commonly have a vagus nerve dysregulation. And when their vagus nerve is dysregulated, they will very commonly become deficient in thiamine. So it's an interesting thing. I've seen a lot of people just through supplementation, find a way of regulation. So again, it's a little individualized because we have a very complex system in our body of metabolics and methylation. And so there's never, ever an easy answer, but I tell you, it's wonderful when we bring it all together and somebody finds that regulation through all these various things. And, and then they're like, they go, Oh my God, I never thought I could feel this good. Just didn't think I could get there. Okay. We'll skip the others. Go ahead, Ron. Next slide. So the take home on this, your autonomic nervous system, your ability to have a, a peaceful heart rate or an appropriate heart rate, right? Uh, blood pressure, um, digestion, being able to interact with food, to uh, be able to um, uh, breathe well, uh, all of this is regulated by the vagus nerve. So if the vagus nerve is off, it's going to, it's going to throw everything else off peripheral enteric, um, all of it. So the vagus nerve regulation can happen incidentally just by having a happy life, right? Some people are just blessed with that happy life. Awesome family, awesome parents, amazing spouse, incredibly incredible children, um, excellent animals all around them. I mean, that is an incidental, wonderful place to be, right? Now, who's to say you can't have that if you got regulated? Some people have that by virtue of having whatever, a happy, lucky life. And then others have to create that by becoming regulated. And then they start attracting all that beautiful stuff to them, right? The happier we are inside, the more we're going to attract it into our lives. Okay, so... There is absolutely no physical, mental, or emotional illness that does not have an ANS imbalance. It just is, it, you're not going to have it. And there is no ANS imbalance that isn't part of an emotional, mental, um, physical illness. Okay. So we are a system and it is constantly, we're constantly receiving information and giving information, receiving and giving. So the more we can regulate that, the, the better off all of our, from, you know, top down from, from our um, ability to fight off chronic disease to engaging in happy social relationships. So now the key to that is that when we become, or when we focus on regulation, we are able then to really partake in the creative process of our life. If you talk to any professional athlete, any artist, they will say nothing happens until they get into the state of flow. 
Otherwise it's complete resistance or they're trying to tell themselves how to do something, right? When we get into flow, and I know all of you have been there at some point in your life, that magical place where you're so involved with what you're doing that you don't even notice the sunset or dinner didn't get made, or it's time to go home, but you're so busy with that project. You're so happy and engaged in that state. People tell me all the time, I forgot that I had neuropathies in my hands. It all went away, Maria. I couldn't even feel it anymore. The, the pain in my back, when we can get into a state of flow, the magical place of creativity and intuition, pain leaves. We're not consciously aware of pain. So it's really um, an enormous benefit to work on autonomic nervous system regulation. Okay, next slide, Ron. That's the end of it there, Maria. That's the end. So just saying, again, thank you so much for spending your Sunday afternoon, for choosing to spend your Sunday afternoon with me. Um, I'm Maria Zilka, and that is how you could reach me if you're interested in talking more about some of those programs. Um, And now, if anybody has any questions, I, I would love to answer them or try to 